the reason we are having this uh, webinar tonight is because uh, as recruiters, we meet a lot of people who um, have a, a slight misconception about what seminary is and about the work that you can pursue through theological education, specifically through seminary. So most times people tend to think that it is strictly for those who want to be uh, pastors, uh, pastors in a parish ministry setting, which is great, but oftentimes they, they don't really know about the other work that people can do in the realm of ministry that go outside of the church walls. So tonight we've invited some uh, wonderful guests of ours, some friends, uh, like Liz mentioned, past, current, and uh, past and current Wesley students to talk about the work that they do. Um, so at this time, as we go forward, I'm going to invite Liz to invite our guests to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Liz Pernicki. I'm a recruiter at Wesley Theological Seminary, and I am a very recent grad. Um, I just graduated a couple weeks ago with my Master of Theological Studies. Woo, woo, and then this is my recruiting woo, woo, partner, Elijah <laughs> Faraby. Yes, I too am a recruiter. I'm a 2019 uh, MDiv grad uh, from Wesley, and it's a joy and a pleasure to always be here with you all. Um, catch us almost every Thursday at this time for another webinar. If we could have each of our guest speakers introduce themselves. So I'll just call you out um, since we're all Zoom boxes right now. So Rachel, could you say a little bit about yourself um, and, and where you work, but don't say too much about your work because we'll come back to that. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm Rachel Luna. I'm the Executive Director of Project Transformation DC. Um, we, uh, I graduated in 2017 with a Master's of Theological Studies from Wesley um, and have always worked within the church, but not in a church. Um, and so I'm excited to be able to share that, share more about that with all of y'all. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Arthur, you're up. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm a Air Force chaplain, I'm a captain in the Air Force. I'm stationed at Moody Air Force Base. Um, I graduated with my MDiv um, from Liberty School of Divinity in 2018, um, and I've been in the DMIN program at Wesley since 20, since last year, 2019. Awesome. Thanks, Arthur, for being here tonight. Chet. Hello, everyone. My name is Chet Jakura. I serve at Bread for the World full time in ministry there. Uh, Bread is a, a faith based nonprofit that advocates for policies that address hunger and poverty. Um, so we are a non governmental organization. Our headquarters are right here in Washington, D.C. I work specifically with the communications team, digital communications this is my area of specialty. And then um, I've been a part-time Wesley student in the MDiv program. I'm, I'm starting my fourth year and hopefully, God willing, my final year. Um, Wesley is a great community, um, but the, the uh, juggling school with work is, is possible, um, but it is not easy. And um, so it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you so much, Chet. Uh, and finally, Jalisa, could you say, uh, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Jalisa Hall. Uh, I am a 2019 MDiv graduate from Wesley Theological Seminary. Um, I hold two full-time jobs. My first job is um, I'm the assistant director of the Community Engagement Institute at Wesley Theological Seminary. And then I'm also the founder and CEO of Raising a Village Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization here in Washington, D.C. Great, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of the panelists for joining us tonight. You all work in such varied, uh, in such varied ministries in the nonprofit world and chaplaincy, and then Bread for the World uh, does a lot of lobbying with Congress and works with a lot of senators. Um, so there are so many different avenues that students can take after seminary if they don't see themselves working in a, in a traditional pastorate. And it's becoming more common. You know, Elijah and I talk to a lot of students who are interested in non-traditional ministry. So I'm really grateful that you four are here and that you can show future students uh, how, how this is done and a lot of the different ways that they can do that. So, um, so I'm gonna start with one question that I'll throw out to you and you all can answer however you want in whatever order you want. Um, and, then, and then this conversation is for prospective students. So a few questions in the chat box 
or or unmute yourself and ask them out loud. Um, and our, our panelists are here for your questions, so we hope you have good questions tonight. Uh, but the first question that I'll start out with is, um, how has your theological education prepared you for the type of work that you do? Um, and how is that theological education, how is that, how has particularly theological education benefit, benefited you in what you do? Yeah, I can begin. Um, Bread, you know, as I said, we're a faith-based organization. And so it is our faith in God um, that compels us, uh, inspires us to advocate um, for policies that address hunger and poverty um, at the congressional level, at the federal legislative level. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm specializing in public theology. Um, it's a specialization um, that you can uh, pursue at Wesley. Um, Wesley has an incredible faculty. Um, and so I've, I've really learned a lot about public theology that is applying your faith in the public space. Um, ways that in our pluralistic society, we can come together across difference and we can, you know, work toward the common good. And so that's obviously at the heart of the work that I do at Bread for the World. It's, it's at the heart of who we are as an organization. Um, and so primarily what I do is I write the emails that we send to our members, that we send to our strategic church partners, um, that hopefully inspire our members to then reach out to their members of Congress. Um, and so I'm, I'm constantly thinking about the, you know, the theological underpinnings of, of what we study and, you know, what we believe, and then applying that in a very practical way that's easy for people to understand, that motivates them to then reach out to their member of Congress to advocate for something that is helping, um, you know, like right now, particularly with the coronavirus, we've been, uh, you know, all hands on deck at Bread. We've been working overtime because this is a, you know, the global pandemic is a hunger crisis. And so um, it's a hunger issue. And um, being able to help our members understand why it's a hunger issue and why as people of faith, they should care about it is is what I do day in, day out. And it's, it's a real... Um, joy, it's a real privilege to be able to accompany our members um, through that journey, through that journey of living out their faith in a public way. I can go next. Um, Project Transformation is a threefold ministry uh, and nonprofit. Um, we work with what we call the three C's, which are children, college-age young adults, and churches. And so, um, and what we our model in a typical year, um, we had to completely reimagine it for COVID-19, but in a typical year, what we do is we run literacy-based summer camp programs in communities where the gap, um, the learning gap, or excuse me, the summer uh, learning slide is the highest. Um, and so we hire young adults from across the country and we invest in them uh, to do vocational discernment and leadership training. And then they run these summer camps, invest, um, and the kids. And so our whole uh, philosophy and theory of change is that uh, communities and people change because of relationships. So we're um, housed in churches. And so our camps are run at two United Methodist churches in DC. And we were kind of in the midst of adding one in Baltimore. Once again, we're having to kind of reimagine all of this. Um, but for me, Wesley helped me be able to translate my theology and help others do the same thing. So I could be one day talking to a seven-year-old about God and then, you know, talking to a 21-year-old who's going through the um, identity formation process that so many young adults go through while also trying to figure out what is my future? What, what am I called to? Where is God calling me in my life? Um, and then also being able to explain that and why it ties into our theology to churches. Um, both the churches where we host our camps and the churches that support the camps. Um, and so Wesley really prepared me to be able to discuss theology um, and, and allow and taught me how to allow space for people to bring their own theology into these conversations. And so it's not just project transformation. This is our theology. We're pushing it. Really, we're creating space so that people can discover God and what they believe. Um, 
and so I think Wesley, because I was part of the community, um, the now something Center for uh, Community Engagement. Um, sorry, they changed names since I graduated, and I can never get it right. Um, but I was part of that, and uh, that also allowed me to kind of almost form my own identity, which helped me when I'm working with these young folks um, as they as they walk through this process together. I'll go. <laughs> um, for me, um, again, I mean, as the assistant director of the Community Engagement Institute, Rachel, that's what it's called now. It's, it's not ICE, it's CEI now. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite um, evident of how, I mean, I work at the seminary, um, so it's kind of, kind of evident of how, um, how my seminary degree has helped um, in that role in particular because in the Community Engagement Institute, um, we have a fellows program that Rachel was talking about, which is called the Community Engagement Fellows Program. It is a three-year program that, um, that is in line with the three-year MDiv program where students um, think um, theologically about um, how to uh, how to be how to make good in the world um, based on you know the theological principles of the Christian faith, and so as the assistant director, um, I help uh, new fellows journey. Um, through that process um, as a fellow myself, uh, as a fellow that, you know, as myself, I, as I used to be. Um, and so that's, that's the practical way. But in terms of raising a village foundation, um, in the practical sense, the Community Engagement Fellows Program helped me launch the nonprofit um, in terms of the funding that we received, the technical assistance that I received, um, and then helping me think about, again, uh, I'm doing nonprofit work, but what does this mean in terms of being in, in the midst of the kingdom of God? What does this mean um, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and using the nonprofit model to do that? And so um, as part of the Fellows Program in, in seminary, they helped me think about even biblical um, is uh, to, to create a scriptural grounding for the work that I do. Um, so literally raising a village foundation has a scriptural grounding, which is Acts 2, 42 through 44. Um, after Pentecost, it made me think about again, um, how to bridge um, the church and the world together. And so seminary really helps you wrestle um, with those types of things in terms of the work that, the work that I do. And so as founder and CEO, um, I manage people um who who coordinate programs and so we have education programs across the district um that focus on academic interventions and um and uh social emotional learning um and so we help elementary middle and high school students both in school and after school so we have in school programs and after school programs um and we help you know journey with actually kids and parents um in the journey of education um and so it's 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 a really gratifying um thing to do but I, I think the way in which i've been so much more comprehensive in the work has been because of seminary because i got a I, ha um, I have a degree from american university um in public administration nonprofit management so you would think i went to american i already have a degree in nonprofit management that that's it right like that i that i know how to do nonprofit work um and it did in terms of the theory um, of nonprofit management, but what seminary did was help me put it into practice in a way that is meaningful, in a way that is comprehensive, in a way that is um, modeling, again, the, the ministry and life of Jesus. Um, and so I'm appreciative of Wesley because of that. I guess I'm uh, next. Um, so for me, I'm a military chaplain, um, I'm, but I'm in the doctor of ministry program. So I didn't get my MDiv from uh, Wesley, but the doctor of ministry program has definitely been enlightening for me. Um, as a military chaplain, especially in the Air Force, it's, it's a great deal of diversity. Um, and that's one thing that Wesley has helped me with is how to engage ministry practices uh, within diverse communities. Um, one of the greatest things is that I'm in the Life Together track, which is how do we develop and build community not just within diverse communities, but how do we do it through the pathway of spirituality? Um, we could, and I also work in the nonprofit sector as um, a director of workforce. So 
trying to really balance both of those lanes. One lane is really where it is mainly predominantly a Black culture. Uh, we deal with families that are experiencing homelessness in the Ward 8 community. And then I go and I balance the work that I do in the Air Force, which is, you know, the population looks much different, but both lanes of work requires a level of spirituality. It requires a level of engagement and how do I take my experiences to help build and form this community. And it's a complex um, dilemma at times, um, but that's one thing that Wesley is, I'm in my fourth class, I'm in my DMIM program, and it's one thing that they are helping uh, walk through. Um, and as, as already stated, they really do help you with putting your ministry and your academic uh, knowledge into practice. Um, so really you have to, you're kind of forced to really put your, um, ministry context into your papers. Um, you're, you're really forced to put it into, um, into what you're reading. You have to really incorporate your ministry context and your lane of work um, into what it is that you're doing. So they make everything that you're doing more practical. I um, mean, that's something that I really love about, like actually love about Wesley because I didn't really get that experience um, when I went to seminary. Um, it was really more abstract type of work. Um, really a lot of, it was highly academic. Uh, really just writing papers and reading books, but not really incorporating your real, um, the, the real level of work that you're doing within your ministry context. So I would say that's um, definitely one way it's helped me on the doctorate of ministry track. Awesome. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, thank each of you for what you just shared. So at this time, we'd like to open the floor up to our guests to ask questions. And if you all decide to be shy and have no questions. We have some questions prepared, um, but please feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to jump in and chime in. Um, this webinar is for your questions about non-traditional work in ministry. So go forth, ask questions. Not a question, but a comment. I am in the diaconate program with the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. So I've completed first year of discernment, second year of classes at the California School of Divinity. It's an online class. And what I heard from every one of your speakers that I absolutely appreciate is the practical application. Uh, this is actually a second career for me, even though I'm a lifelong Episcopalian, so I feel like I've been doing it for a very long time, wearing all of the hats. I appreciate um, the last comment that was made about um, having your papers really reflect for us, it would be our call and the work that we want to do right now, everything that I have done in terms of classwork is largely academic. And so I don't have the grounding that I would like to have. So I'm kind of out there on faith. Um, my goal would be to at least take a class at Wesley this summer. And I was beginning to look. So I'll follow up with you, Elijah, because I think we had talked once before. So I'd like to do that. But I just wanted to start with telling the panelists that I appreciate they're sharing their experience. I heard a similar theme through all of them, enough for me to say, oh, maybe that's the missing piece. So I appreciate that. Thank you. If I may ask a question. Um, my name is Danzel Jones um, from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I was just kind of wondering if all the panelists doesn't mind speaking to you, kind of like what made you choose um, Wellesley Sem Seminary out of like all the other types of like colleges, university and seminary that are across the, that are across the US. I guess for, for me, um, the school was local. That was the first thing. Um, and I wanted to stay local uh, for, the, for the sake of really remaining, doing things like this, remaining engaged in this part of the process for um, academics for me. So I definitely wanted to be close to the school. Um, also the school, after doing a lot of research on the school and as many have already talked about this public engagement and public theology type of focus that Wesley has, you really do not find it at many seminaries or universities or school um, that has this really major push to um, let you know that you do have somewhat of a civic obligation 
um, and talking about the ministry of Jesus and talking about this uh, ministry towards those who are oppressed or most in need of service. Um, and that, that has been one of the main focuses that I think have been perpetuated throughout the entire uh, academic process here. And so that was one thing that stuck out to me the most is, you know, because seminaries, as already stated, can be very academic. Um, schools can be very focused on the, the coursework, the readings, and not really, because when you start to really um, incorporate uh, the practice into ministry, these are things that you have to address that I think Wesley has done a great job at addressing, especially being in Washington, D.C. Cool. Yeah, I'll go. I think similar to Arthur, um, Arthur for me, it was a local decision. Um, I was already starting my career here in Washington, D.C., and so I wasn't looking to move um, because I really enjoy being in the city. Um, but then it, from there, it was about um, looking for a seminary or a divinity school that wasn't a pastor factory. Um, and what I mean by that is that their, their goal was not just to churn out pastors. And there's nothing wrong with pastors. Clearly, I go to a church. I'm in the process of ordination as we speak. However, um, there was a real focus on Wesley on, again, um, thinking deeply and comprehensively about ministry outside of the church, that it is a both and, not an either or. And that's something that I really, really appreciated um, because I think, at the, I think the church, even in this space of COVID-19, has to think about ministry differently, right? Um, that the typical ways of doing ministry aren't just cutting it. It wasn't cutting it anyway, but it's definitely <laughs> cutting it in the midst of a pandemic. And so Wesley, I think a lot of us that have come out of this space um, were already in some ways prepared for this and already innovative in thinking about um, how to engage with people in new spaces and, and innovatively. And so um, I would say um, that that is why I chose Wesley because they already put you in a space to be ahead of the curve and what we call contextually nimble um, is something that we use in the CEI um, department is being contextually nimble. And that is what um, Wesley is all about in terms of um, bringing about faith leaders. Uh, yeah, I was not local. Um, I think I'm the only panelist who wasn't when I made my decision. I was living in Nashville, and I had a roommate at the time who was like, you should, uh, I was looking at grad schools, not looking at seminary, just grad schools, um, and my roommate was, uh, and he picked Perkins, but he was looking at Wesley, and he said, no, this is for you, um, and handed me the pamphlet, and I think two weeks later, I was on the flight uh, to D.C. to visit. Um, there was like Jaleesa said, the contextualness of being able to, and I knew I wasn't going to be a pastor. That has never been a call in my life, but like trying to figure out where I fit was what I was looking for. But I, and I knew like I needed that context and that practicality. And so um, this uh, CEI was what drew me to Wesley. And then the, really the focus on community, uh, most of my life has been living in community with others. Um, and so just that focus on community and truly like what you're doing in the classroom is not just like what you're doing at your ministry context, but it's what's going on at the tables, um, in the refectory, which I still don't know why we call it that. Um, but like everything you do, um, is about community, like communities going into the classroom and, and all of that. And so that was what drew me, um, as if you can't tell that community is like kind of where I feel like God is calling me is creating community um, and so that was being able to practice that at Wesley was very important to me. So I had already been living in DC for a couple years before I found my way to Wesley. Um, I'd always been interested in um, faith and politics and social justice and advocacy um, which, you know, ultimately brought me to DC and into working at Bread for the World. Um, but I also, you know, had for many years, which I kind of fled from this call to ordain ministry as well. And so in order to be um, ordained in the United Methodist Church, um, I'm United Methodist, um, you have to earn a MDiv. And so um, very convenient um, that uh, there's a United Methodist Seminary in Washington, D.C., where I was already living. And so I chose Wesley um, 
you know, initially because, you know, it's convenient. And, you know, honestly, I had to keep working. Um, I had to be working full time to be able to pay the bills and, you know, pay for tuition. Um, and so leaving job, you know, leaving my job was, was not an option for me economically. Um, and so I was very, very lucky that Wesley ended up being in DC so I could not have to give up work. Um, and then when I enrolled in Wesley, um, it, it turned out to be just an incredible providential blessing. Um, I have really not regretted um, a single day at Wesley. The community that, that I have um, formed, the, you know, the classmates, the professors, um, the passion, the quality of education I've received, the heart, um, you know, that drives all of, of the work work um, at Wesley just confirms for me every single day um, that I made the right decision, that it, it wasn't just a convenient place to study, but it was the right place to study, and in fact, the only place I would want to study to get my MDiv. Uh, the public theology program I have been so impressed with, um, and it has really enabled me to, to connect the dots in very meaningful, practical ways that have spiritually nourished me as well. Um, and so, you know, that's not even getting into the quality education um, that's offered um, at Wesley. And so I have been just so incredibly um, graced with my time at Wesley. And, and, you know, I said earlier when I was introducing myself how, you know, I'll be happy to be done um, just because it's a lot to juggle work and school full time. And you want to be present to your life and to your loved ones and to all of that. Um, but I will really definitely miss, you know, the routine and the community and the conversations um, that have formed as well. It's been a real gift. Thank you, panelists. Those are such wonderful, wonderful answers. And so heartfelt too, you're all so passionate. Thank you for bringing your authentic selves here. Any other burning questions that you have for our panelists this evening? I have one. I feel like it's kind of been um, answered, but I am specifically looking for the impact that you believe that your theological education has made into the ministries outside of the walls of the church. What is the impact? Are you looking for specific numbers or anecdotal like stories or like when you mean impact, can you parse that out a little bit for me, or at least for me? So just in, in your base of calling, I'm newly admitted. So I haven't, I'm pretty much scratching the surface of like where I'm going outside. Like many of you have said, I don't, I, when I answered the call to ministry, it was not to be a pastor. God was very clear about that. And so it was almost like when my pastor asked me, well, why seminary? And I was like, well, because God said seminary. So like for me, I want to know what impact does my theological education can give in, and I'll use the buzzword because I've been writing them down, the civil, the civic obligation to the DC area to people to people to God's children at large what is that impact what how do you weave the right. two especially when you're dealing with the secular right. people who not necessarily are not even believing that there is a God you know what I mean how do you have that kind of like well I believe I'm not trying to press you to believing but I want to be able to still own true to who I am as a believer and then also still respect your space as a non-believer, but give you Christ anyway. So how, 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 how has that impacted? If, you, if anybody has dealt with that. I'll, I'll go first. I would say seminary for me gave me language. Like sometimes you need language to name some stuff. Right. And what I mean by that is a lot of times like we say things that we've heard, um, you know, the Bible says, right. Like, but, but usually when we say the Bible says we've usually are quoting what somebody told us the Bible said. Right. It's that's different from what the Bible reads. Right. And so seminary 
gives you language. It names some things, right? Um, to help you better articulate your witness, right? Um, but also to be able to move out in the world as someone who is a learned person. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, I think that um, seminary has helped me so much in a, in a myriad of ways. One, again, it has helped me to contextualize my own ministry, my own nonprofit ministry, to really model it as, as, G, um, as Jesus' inaugural sermon in Luke 4 right? Like it's been able to, it's been able for me to say, I am, I am the raising a village foundation is what, as Jesus pulled out the scroll and talked about, right? Being and caring for the prisoner, the widow, the poor, like that was Jesus's first sermon, which means that seminary gave me that language, that story, that context to know what my, what, what my commission is, right? As a Christian. The other piece is, again, it's helped me to be a gateway and not a gatekeeper. And what I mean by that is, is that I'm not in a place, and again, I, I come from Pentecostal roots, to be, to be honest with you, and now I'm Methodist, so you can see what seminary has also done to me. But, but, on, a, but, on, a, but on a real note, um, what I mean by being a gateway and a gatekeeper is now I have a much more broader lens about the Christian faith and who Jesus was as a person, right? So I, so because of that, um, it has allowed me to be way more innovative and open to how the spirit moves. So that means that the spirit doesn't, I'm just not anointed if I'm just behind the pulpit, right? But I am just as anointed sitting at my desk crunching numbers to figure out how many children are we going to serve this month, right? Like that is just as anointed and gifted and all of that than it is to be behind a pulpit and hooping, right? Like, so, so seminary gave me the ability to see God much bigger, to see Jesus's ministry much bigger. Then that allowed me to engage with people in the secular, much more with a much more compassionate understanding heart understanding that this is because you don't believe in what I believe we are still part you are still God's good creation and my job is not to convert you but to maybe shine a light on who Jesus is by doing what God has called me to do does that make sense um so that was a long-winded answer but I think it was a poignant question because um I, I can be honest with, at least from my experience, and, and, I, and the panel could have a totally different experience, but seminary did not necessarily answer a lot of questions for me. It did some, um, but it more, it, it made me more of a open, understanding, comprehensive, contextually nimble believer. Um, and I think like that, again, that, that's my experience. <laughs> so uh, I hope that, does that answer your question? It does. It, it, it's, it does because I too think on the two kind of spectrum side, like I don't just, it's not just my way. Like I like to look at what I believe, but then also how the other person is feeling. And I think that's probably why God called me to not ministry in the church, but to minister outside the church. Because of course, inside the church is, I'm Baptist. And Black Baptist, you know, it's like, what the preacher and the elder says is true. You don't have to ask anybody else, you know? So it's, it's one of those things that's like, no, you do have to ask. So I do appreciate that. I do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll be connecting with you a little bit more when I get, you know, when classes start. And I would, I would just add, um, though I work at a faith-based nonprofit, not everyone at my nonprofit is a believer. Um, there are a number of, of atheists and agnostics on the staff, but they're committed deeply to the cause of ending hunger and poverty. Um, and so um, I believe that we're all ministers. We're all called to minister to other people, um, you know, to one another. And it may not be necessarily from the pulpit, but certainly um, my time at Wesley, my calling to ordain ministry, um, has helped me think about how I can minister to my colleagues outside of the church. So I had a colleague um, whose father and actually fiance died within the span of a week. Uh, very, very tragic. 
Um, I do meditation for the staff about once a month. Um, and so this particular colleague, you know, joined my meditation that I offer for the staff. Um, and she said it was very healing and helpful for her personally on a personal level. So I can be attentive to the needs of my colleagues and provide, you know, pastoral care um, by being understanding, by being compassionate, by being merciful, um, not necessarily, you know, actually sitting down and, and, you know, helping them through their situation, right, because I'm not their pastor at the end of the day, but I am a colleague. And so, you know, how does my calling, how does my, um, my ministry outside the church impact the way that I interact and engage with people, including people that I disagree with? You know, how do I still meet them um, with mercy and extend grace and be a non-anxious presence? That's what I talk a lot about at work is, is how can we be non-anxious presences, um, you know, for our colleagues? And so that's a different, you know, take on, on the question. Um, but I also think it's an important way because we, we're all ministers. It's just not necessarily from the pulpit. Uh, I'll kind of share a little story about how I think Wesley helped shape me so that I could open up space. Um, Project Transformation, we are a faith-based organization. We have a cross on our logo. Um, but this past summer, we had uh, a Muslim intern. We had an atheist intern. Um, and, we invite, and we have worship. So, like, the interns came in knowing we were a Christian faith-based organization that we held worship every week. Um, and I think a little bit of our the contextual nibbleness, we realized how we could invite um, the the interns who might feel othered in work in a Christian worship into uh, the practice into it. Um, and so actually, our atheist uh, drew this during worship one time um, as his like offering to worship. Um, and so he Cornell West is now my background for all my Zoom calls. But um, and so we just being able to see the impact of like um, these young adults who feel cared for by this Christian organization, even though they do not believe the same. And then the impact that they make because they feel so invested in and love that they make the kids they work with feel just as invested in and love. And so it's, it's kind of for me been able to, um, as one of our great professors, Dr. Clark always says, is passionately Christian, but compassionately um interface and i think that we brought that to project transformation of we are passionately who we are but we have all this compassion for folks who who don't necessarily believe the same and i also um quite a few of our alumni kind of like me end up going to seminary um and so i think it also is helping those folks who will become pastors learn how to work in an interfaith environment before they even take the steps to go to seminary um, so that might be kind of a, a very uh, story that shows what the impact of like a, a Wesley education and um, teaching prepared me to be able to help these young adults through that situation. Awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, so we have about four minutes left in our time together. Um, and in keeping in respect of time for everyone, um, our panelists, I'd like to ask you all to um, offer one word of advice for those who are discerning what that non-traditional call looks like. Um, if you could offer anything from your own experience as a word of advice for those who are discerning, what would that mean? So I guess for me, it would be um, to have somewhat of an understanding on, as you were, um, as Ebony was saying, um, that you knew that the Lord did not call you to, or that ministry was not inside of the church, to, all, to know that that ministry that you have or that you feel that may not be inside of the four walls of the church is just as valuable as those who are pastors inside of the church. And to always have that context in mind, especially with any, um, with going through seminary, um, knowing what your call is, knowing what it is that you are called to do and who you are called to reach. And I will say that Wesley, um, definitely through the classes that I have taken are not really pushing people into the church, but also embracing those who are called to the church. Um, so finding that way to build uh, the community, um, whether you are inside of the church or outside of the church is really just about really the, the Christ that you are or the 
your worship that you are embodying, um, how that is going to uh, portray outwardly. So I would say kind of have an understanding on what you're called to do and to know it's just as valuable uh, regardless of whether you're in the church or out of the church. I'll say quickly, um, I think this is just more broad, but seminary is a journey. It is not a sprint. Um, and so with that, to, with that being said, I think everyone just needs to be open to how spirit moves. And we serve a very creative God. And the same way that the spirit hovered over the waters, right, in Genesis, like let the spirit hover over you um, in this process because um, there'll be things that will surprise you even about yourself and your ministry. And so just be open to how spirit moves and, and you'll, be, you'll be just fine. I think I would say don't limit God. Um, I think so much of what my preconceptions about seminary was like, you know, I just like, I don't know. Um, but I came in and I was like, that kind of, and I, I had a theology of a, a built in theology that like God was just this. And like, I think realizing like my call and, and just being and seeing how God uses all of these folks, I realized that God has no limit. Um, and so, but I also, I think that thought was what kind of kept me from going to seminary earlier um and so i don't know why that's what came to me that's not normally what i say to this question but uh maybe someone needed to hear it i'll share some advice that a, a friend and classmate shared with me um as we as we were uh, concluding the pm and m the practice and mission and ministry two-year internship and colloquy um, meetings, she said, if God has called you, God will see you through. And I actually have that written down on a post-it right here on my desk. I'm looking at it right now. Um, and that just really was very liberating for me to receive that. If God has called you, God will see you through. Um, seminary is indeed a journey. Uh, it is not a sprint. It's a journey. It is a transformative journey. Um, it is a journey that will, you know, deconstruct all your beliefs and then rebuild them. Um, and it has been so enriching personally and spiritually. Um, it has been trying at times too. It has been exhausting. Um, and, but it's been very worth it. And so knowing, you know, that God has called each and every one of you. I know that for a fact. God has called you all uniquely and beautifully um, to do whatever you are called to do and to trust that and to really know deep in your bones that. Uh, because when you, when you know that deep in your bones, you can return to that. And, and that will get you through when the times are difficult. If God has called you, God will see you through. Thank each of you. Um, we really, really appreciate you taking your time out to share um, your story, your experience, and your heart, hearts with us tonight. Um, this has been a wonderful webinar. Um, I want to thank each one of our guests who uh, showed up tonight to be with us. Um, and uh, want you to remember to check your emails tomorrow because Liz and I will be reaching out to each of you um, to continue the conversation that we started tonight about discernment, about seminary, about what that will look like through Wesley. Um, and because the conversation is not over, also be on the lookout on our visit page for the other events we have coming up as well, where you may see some of these faces again and have a lot of your other questions answered as well. But right now, I would like to invite uh, Jalisa to close us in prayer um, and extend a thank you to each one of you again for uh, being here with us tonight. Um, and now at this time, Jalisa, please go forward. Will you pray with me? Gracious, merciful, creating God. We thank you for this time that we have gathered in your presence as we learned about the wonderful ways in which Wesley uh, invites us to cultivate um, each other into religious, faith-filled, creative, contextually nimble leaders. God, we pray that even as we're in the midst of this pandemic, that, God, that you will give us clarity in the midst of confusion, God, that you will fine tune our destiny in the midst of discernment. 
God, we pray in the name of Jesus that as we discern in this space about where you have called us to go, God, that you will open our eyes so we can see you, that you will open our ears so we can hear you, and you will open our hearts so we can feel you. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, amen.